So to Brad and Danny, best to you and your podcast on OU football. Go get them, boys. All right, we are back. Owen Field hype. Uh, so end of an era, OU played its last Big 12 game. Wasn't the Big 12 game we wanted to be for the last game, but nonetheless, we end our time in the Big 12, 10 and 2. Brad, what did you think about the game against BYU? I'm mean, sorry, TCU, TCU. Yeah, no, I, I enjoyed the game. Um, you know, I thought we were going to, put our uh, foot on their neck a little bit, uh, you know, better than, than what we did and put, put them out a little earlier, let them kind of run the score up on us, even though I don't think the game was really ever in jeopardy, but because of, you know, our offensive output as well. Um, great game called by Jeff Levy. Uh, D- Dylan Gabriel is on fire again, Dan. And uh, I love, I still love our wide receivers. Saul Chuck has continued to get going the last couple games. Everything looked good. I mean, our defensive, you know, efforts have kind of fell off a little bit the last couple of weeks as we continue to get injured and play so many snaps. It's kind of – that's the pick your poison with this uh, offense that we run and almost 900 plays um, over the season. Um you know, we you put your defense out there a lot. Whether you score quickly and, and and give the ball back to the other team, or you go three and out quickly and give the ball back to the other team. Either way, your defense is on the field a lot. So there were some good things, there were some bad things, but overall, you lose, you know, seven games last year, six and seven season, turn around to ten wins this year. Um, it's going to give you a catapult to uh, finish out strong in recruiting before this first SEC season. No, no, I mean, you know, definitely a good game by DG, but, uh, you know, uh, I think one of the things we need to look at, what a game, what a game, a final farewell game for Drake Stoops, another 100-yard game, uh, got into the end zone, and you saw that hug with his dad at the end of the game. Man, to think about it, uh, this would uh, – Next year will be the first time in 24 years we don't have a Stoops as a coach or a player at OU. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. Uh, you know, Drake, it started out, it was kind of one of those, I think Joe Castiglione's kid was on the team at some point as well too. And you've seen a little bit of that at Clemson as well with, Swain, you know, um, Sweeney's kids and even Brent's kids were playing on the teams and it kind of gets to that point to where you're kind of like yeah they're getting the opportunity they're on a special teams type of role whatever but and maybe that creeped in a little bit when thinking of Drake Stoops as well but at the end of the day he put his time in he put the work in and he's a he's a really really good player Dan and he he might be a pretty good player in the NFL, too, in that slot position. I mean, there's there's some teams that could use him. We'll, we'll see if he goes to the NFL. You know, I've been debating a lot with some people on uh, social media about uh, Drake Stoops and even DG. I mean, both those guys, uh, I don't know if they're going to be in the NFL, uh, you know, honestly. A lot of people are sitting there saying, well, DG's, uh, you know, top five in stats and stuff like that. Well, stats don't mean that much being top something in stats to go into the NFL. Sure. Uh, well, that, so, and the but, argument you're using is exactly why I think Drake Stoops will play in the NFL. But, uh, you know, so, I remember- with Drake, it's not about his athleticism. It's not, he understands how to get open with what he has. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if and- that's not a Wes Welker type, I don't know what it, I mean, he's the ultimate leverage using his body, understanding where to catch, uh, you know, catch the ball and how to kind of torque his body. And, you know, you see some of those tight roping, the way he gets his toes down. That's some NFL stuff right there. He doesn't have to blow past people. He can get in those slants. And, and uh, you know, he's also a physical blocker, not that he's – I mean, he's obviously got a – he's not, he's not going to be big enough to, you know, make too much of a problem for anybody, but – in the no, no. slot position, like a New England type player, uh, I think he's going to be 
uh, mm-hmm. be able to do something. No, no, no. I've always liked what Stoops brought to the game, man. I mean, I I mentioned it several times to you before, you know, a few seasons ago. I was like, it's kind of funny. We get all these five-star wide receivers and stuff like that, and our number one target is Drake. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You were all like, well, we got this big-name wide receiver. I'm like, okay. And I, I watched the game, and I'm like, it's kind of funny. We got this big-name wide receiver, and we're throwing the ball to Stoops more than we are these big name wide receivers, but no, no, it was a, it it was a good overall game, man. I mean, like you, I, I was a little bit disappointed in the third quarter with the defense kind of softening up. I mean, we let them score double what they scored in the first half in the third quarter alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know if that was, you know, a combination of sending in a whole bunch of young players and stuff like that or what was going on. But, no, I mean, we, we, we should have – I don't know, man. I, when when we had 42 on them in the first half, I was like, is he going to try to put up 100? Final – you know, final F you to the Big 12? Well, you remember last year when TCU had a good year and they played us. I mean, they put, what, 50, almost 60 up on us. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that was rough, and they didn't slow down any time during that game, and we were having some real issues, uh, especially in the secondary in that game. So I think maybe that was a little bit of it, which uh, nothing wrong with that. Hey, you did it to us last year. You know, we, we got some stuff we can still work on. We might go to the Big 12 championship still. Uh, you know, this is obviously before the Texas game. But so, yeah, I, I they they keep running their plays and it, the score runs up a little bit more. I, I don't see a problem with it, really. But Well, you, you mentioned the Big 12 championship game. You know, yeah, that was, that, that was goal number one for us. It didn't happen. Uh, Big 12 championship is now going to be Texas versus little brother, Oklahoma state, uh, you know, kind of, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to watch that game. Honestly, you know, I might watch it. Don't, you know, it, 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 it does have a little bit of an impact on us because if Oklahoma state upsets Texas, uh, that will affect our ranking just like uh, the outcome of the Georgia-Alabama game will affect our ranking. uh, Louisville-Florida State game will affect our ranking. Uh, You know, and a lot of people are sitting there saying, well, what does ranking have to do with it? We're not in the Big 12 championship. We're not going to the playoff. It's going to help us in getting ourselves, uh, you know, talking to some recruits and also, I think, a better bowl game situation, you know, depending on where we're ranked. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think the top 12 teams, uh, they work that out a certain way for those New Year's Six Bowls, and then they give – I think they give one spot in that top 12 uh, to a the top group of five team. Um, so we're right there on the cusp. We're very close. Um, so th- things could still change. Right now I think we're projected for the Alamo Bowl uh, in San Antonio. So. Um, I know fans aren't real excited about that, but um, you know it'd be it still you know it'd be nice if we're playing in Arizona from the Pac-12, for example. Uh, they've had a really good year this year, but if we can go into the Alamo Bowl and get a good win there and get you know BV's confidence up, get him a bowl win, his first bowl win as a head coach, and and as you said, keep the recruiting going. But yeah, you know you're right. I mean there there might still be some wiggle room there with the conference championship games, and who knows? See what happens. Well, because, you know, honestly, I almost think a Texas loss to Oklahoma State, right, uh, Oklahoma State's not going to jump 15 slots with a win against no. Texas. Uh, that would put us as the highest-ranking Big 12 team. Um, so, yeah, it will be interesting to see which way that goes for us because if Texas does win and for some – I don't know – for some reason, they don't go to the playoff. That puts them at the highest rank, Big Twelve, yeah. going in for a bowl. So, uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of where we could squeeze in. That's a good point. If they if they go to the playoff, 
um, which right now I would say um, if Bama beats Georgia, that's an issue because then they're mm-hmm. it's going to be uh, Georgia Bama probably both getting in. Um, you know, and then you got Oregon Washington is still to play. I personally think Oregon's a two, number two or th- third best team in the country i I don't think washington's going to beat them again they made a lot of mistakes in that first game they're oregon's a really good team they were also playing in seattle during that game so i can see uh michigan michigan's gonna michigan's gonna be in there uh iowa can't score uh they'll probably try to field goal them to death and michigan will run it up run the score up in that that big 10 championship game and honestly, Florida State with uh, their lose with uh, their starting quarterback out, I don't know if they're going to beat Louisville. I was so excited about them too, and you know they they're an exciting team to watch, and they mm-hmm. they have some really cool pieces. Uh, it reminds me of teams that we've had in the past, where it's like you got a really good wide receiver, a big guy, you got a good really good edge player, a really dynamic quarterback. You're not just this all world recruiting team like a Georgia or or just not this crazy physical team like Michigan, but you have all these cool pieces in there mm-hmm. that ended up making for a really good team. And, yeah, the QB goes down, as you mentioned. And, uh, yeah, it just – I don't know if it's going to work out. Although Louisville just took an L to Kentucky, so we'll see how they recover from that. Yeah, um, yeah. But let's talk about the other big news, man. I was uh, I was predicting this after our two losses. I kept on saying it might be time for – Jeff Levy to leave Norman. A lot of fans weren't happy about my comments on that, you know, and it's nothing again. I mean, Jeff Levy is an offensive offensive genius when it comes to designing plays. But the one thing that I think was uh, did us in those two games was his play calling, the timing of when to call certain plays and stuff like that came back to bite us in the rear end. But Jeff Levy leaves us to uh, join a rival SEC team as the head coach going to Mississippi State. And uh, another shocking news to a lot of people that when I was sitting there saying Levy should leave, well, if Levy leaves, Jackson Arnold will leave. We got confirmation from Jackson Arnold's father. He's not going anywhere. He's staying in Norman. Like I told you guys, he's from North Texas. It's a three-hour drive. Mississippi State's not a three-hour drive. That's why Jackson Arnold was going to stay in Norman. But Jeff Levy goes to Mississippi State. Brad, what do you think about that uh, opportunity for Jeff Levy? Yeah, hey, it's it's great for him. Um, you know, he uh, positioned before Oklahoma. He was uh, offensive coordinator for Ole Miss. Uh, seen the tweet that came out. Uh, from um, Lane Kiffin, o- Ole Miss head coach, uh, talking about how, uh, oh, Jeff, it's good to have you back. I see you missed the food over here in Mississippi. but <laughs> So poking a little fun there. But, no, it's a great opportunity. The, the way I like to look at this, Dan, is we have really good pieces, uh, really good coaches, analysts. Uh, we can hire from within the program. A lot of people like Seth Luttrell. I like Seth Luttrell as, as well. Um, you know, we got uh, other pieces that we can promote within. We got plenty of resources. Uh, we were paying Jeff Libby, I think, north of $2 million. $2 million. I mean, $2 million. We, we can go get, you know, uh, there's a lot of guys out there that we can get. I know I'm hearing a, some different names, but I think this is mutually beneficial for both parties. I know people really want to talk about how this is going to be you know, we finished fourth overall in two different categories in the nation with offense. He was doing a really good job of producing what we needed for the entirety of a game to win games. Situationally, yeah, it was some questionable stuff, questionable play calling in certain situations. I also put a little bit of that on BV. He's got to take over a little bit more and and let a guy know like, like a Lebby, hey man, don't don't fool around here. Let's just run it up the gut, you know, that type of thing, depending on the c- scenario. Um, but Lebby's going to go get paid a little more money. He's going to get to take on his first role as a head coach. And, um, you know, that's place has a really cool fan base. And, you know, hey, good for him, man. And look, 
I mean, I think it's only up from here for Oklahoma too because guess what? We've we've kept it moving, Dan. We've kept it moving. We've lost a lot of really good play callers, and we've kept it moving. So, well, uh, you know, been- and, and and you know, you mentioned Latrell, and that'll be a good uh, that'll be good uh, a good person at OC. And I mentioned a name to you when we were talking on the phone, man. What about Sean Lewis? Sean Lewis got demoted yeah. at Colorado after OC, and Colorado brought in uh, I think it was Pat Shermer three weeks ago to be the OC, former NFL OC for uh, – at one point was the uh, OC for my Philadelphia Eagles at one point. Uh, was also uh, coaching at Cleveland Browns. So Deion Sanders brings in uh, an NFL OC to kind of groom his star quarterback, a.k.a. his son. Uh, but Sean Lewis, I think, would be a – a good person to look at, maybe even get in for an interview because he's going to be looking for a new job. Uh, And honestly, what he was able to do in those first few weeks at Colorado was, I think, amazing. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, getting together a team of transfers that a lot of players weren't familiar with playing with each other. I mean, outside of uh, Sanders and Travis Hunter, there was nobody else on that offense that was used to being around each other Um, short of an offensive line, Colorado probably would have won eight, nine games. Yeah. You, yeah, you, you nailed it right there. That's exactly what I was going to say. You know, um, I watched a few of the games. Uh, I think a lot of people maybe, you know, fell off a little bit after a couple of bad losses and maybe didn't pay as close attention to them. But from what I seen, a lot of the issues was an offensive line, uh, you just really in in football on any level, you just can't do much mm-hmm. without a decent offensive line. It doesn't matter how good of a play caller you have. So, um, yeah, no, Sean Lewis is a great name. Uh, mentioned Seth Latrell, Willie Corn, Coastal Carolina offensive coordinator, former quarterback at Clemson. Um, you know, they, I'm hearing some other names. The offensive coordinator at Kansas that's been there since 2021 with Lance Leipold, they've been putting out some really good squads offensively, beat Texas a few uh, in a few years. Uh, they beat us this year, obviously. Um, you know, they do a lot with, uh, with, with, with not much, Dan. They do a lot with a little. Uh, they got a few pieces, uh, some guys that can really ball, but, so he's done a good job there as well. I can't pronounce his name, so I'm not going to try. But, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, but, again, we'll keep it moving, Dan. We're, o- oh, we're yeah. OU, man. So. Oh, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, uh, going into the SEC, the process doesn't stop. Uh, like I said in the beginning of uh, the season, a lot of people are talking about, oh, OU and Texas are coming to the SEC. They're going to be playing big boy uh, ball now. Nah, we, we've always been big boys. You know, I mean, look what Texas did to Alabama. Look what we did to Texas. You know, we've always been big boys. Uh, we're going to handle what well, we're going to handle ourselves pretty well in the SEC. Now, do I think we're going to be at the same level as a Georgia and Alabama off the bat? No, but we're not going to be Vanderbilt. We're not going to be, you know, basement dwellers uh going into going into the conference uh i think we'll be uh you know going in i think we're going to be a second tier first tier being a georgia uh alabama i might put lsu on that first to, uh that that, that uh, uh top tier right now but i think we're going to be right there with a tennessee uh, Missouri. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I completely agree with that. That's going to be at that level. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Uh, that you know, I think we'll be there competing with Ole Miss and Missouri and Tennessee. I, I think we'll be at that level. You know, every now and then Florida has a decent year uh, or an Auburn. You know, I, I think we'll be slightly above, you know, some of those teams and, and be at that second tier level. And, um, you know, I see I, I see us maybe, you know, probably winning eight games next year unless we can really 
do well, do some good things in the portal. I mean, and and I only say that, Dan, because they really gave it to us, man, with this schedule. This first schedule is going to be probably the toughest schedule in the nation. Um, and then, but after after this first year in the SEC coming up, uh, they're gonna they'll change some things around. I think it'll even out a lot more, and I, I think we'll start getting getting going pretty good for for our team. So. So, but here, here's my question for you. And I, I've been looking at, you know, uh, how we played this year. What area do you think we need to focus on before we go into the SEC? Yeah, I think you got to start uh, with the defensive line, right? So we're getting some push, getting a little bit of rush. Uh, but going against the schedule that we played this year, Dan, it's just not a very good schedule. Um the physicality that we went up against some of the old lines that we went up against and struggled, uh, were some of the worst in the power five. Um, so we got to get that short up. We got some good guys coming in, some, some good recruits, uh, but we got to get on the transfer portal. Uh, we got to get that. We got to get some bigger bodies in there, just some disruptors. We, we got some edge players that we can develop and we can get going, but we need some disruptors in there. Some guys that can, Take on some double teams and get get our guys off the edge on on the outside uh, techniques as well. Just get them freed up a little bit more so they can cause some chaos. And then from there, I would just say, you know, we got to be more consistent in our run game. Um, I'm hoping that this offensive coordinator, whoever we got coming in, you know, the the downside for me of the Jeff Lebby era, Dan was. I thought him being a former offensive line guy, him being a running backs coach at Baylor, then him becoming an offensive coordinator. I mean, can you think about the to that's the total package to be a good play caller for run schemes. And I just haven't seen it the past 2 years. I feel like we got we just just way too slow as far as how we got going in the run game and uh so I think we we really need to get that going back. So for me, it's it's an NFL package, man. It's defensive line, and it's a good run game. Well, you know, I mean, defensive line. I definitely think we need to address the issue. I mentioned this in one of our in one of our previous uh, episodes. What happened to the sacks? You know, we we weren't we weren't getting to the quarterback and stuff like that. Now we have some defense. We have some young guys coming in that are impressive. Uh, you know, their highlight films are impressive. They're uh, their measurables are impressive, but we got to see what they can do uh, once they're actually on the field with uh, pads and cleats at the collegiate level. Uh, but, you know, you talk about the running game not being existent for two years. Brad, the running game's not been existent for multiple years. Ever since Lincoln Riley became the head coach, running game's been, you know, outside of the quarterback. Running well, game has been. And, and and I just want to point out, too, I'm not talking about statistics, just statistics, Dan. I'm talking about, um, you know, because we did have good years to st statistically. Statistically, we had some good years. Under yes. Riley. But what I'm talking about, and I think the same thing is what you're talking about. Yeah, we, I'm talking about is, driving the ball down people's throats constantly. Right, and also managing the game yeah. appropriately. If yeah. you're If you only have four yards to go, and you're on second down or even third down, and you're on the other side of the four or third side of the 40 where you're going to be going for it and fourth down anyway, you should be able to get that. And we're, yeah. you know, yeah. that's the situation that I want to be in. I want to be able to manage games. And look, the most important thing to me, too, that, that I've been upset with the past few years, Dan, when we get a lead and we don't know what to do, mm -hmm. we get a lead and you can't just. I, I watch games all day long. Well, a lot a lot of times we're, ours is the first game because 11 a.m. kicks. Hopefully that changes a little bit too with the SEC. But you watch every other game, and for the most part, people handle their business. They yeah. get a lead, and then they can kill the clock. They can control the rest of the game. We just can't do it. And yeah. and it's being Oklahoma, that's just unacceptable, and that's another thing I want to see change. So hopefully, right, we'll get that right, because we, you know, I, 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 I th when I think of Oklahoma football, man, I think of, you know, the days of Quentin Griffin. I think of the days of Adrian Peterson, Demarco Murray. You know, when we had Joe Mixon and Samaje. You know, uh, days where 
look, we may go a whole quarter where we don't throw the ball because we got the lead and our running backs can get five, six yards a carry. And uh, so my my thing that I hope we address is offensive line because when it came to the run game early on in the season, I wouldn't really sit there and say it was our running backs. Uh, Marcus Major is a good running back. You know, uh, Walker's a good running back. Uh, we didn't see uh, – uh, what's his name? Uh, ba- Barnes? Yeah, Javante Barnes. Yep, we didn't see right. him much this, this season. I think he was mostly banged up a lot throughout this season. But – a lot of the lack of the run running attack early on in the season, I kind of put on the offensive line a little bit. They weren't getting much of a push in that uh, center guard, uh, right guard, center, left guard uh, area. They weren't getting much of a push for our guys because, you know, the stat shows we were averaging 2.1 yards a carry, you know, for a while. Yeah, no, I I completely agree, and I think we talked about that earlier on our episodes. We talked about in early in the season because I had seen a trend with Bill Beatonbow uh, as far as moving around pieces, and it's nothing wrong with moving around pieces, Dan, but you can't be doing it the fifth game in the season. No, you got to figure that out a little bit earlier than that. Like, you know, um, next year it'll be interesting to see. I know the schedule's out. I don't think the actual makeup of the schedule of when every game is in the schedule. I don't think that's out yet. So it'll no, be interesting no, we, to see what games are, are earlier in September or late in late September and and kind of project on that. You can start making projections on, okay, what, what type of position are we going to be in by the time we play uh, Tennessee at home, let's say. Well, so, so the actual uh... – the actual schedule is out as far as the days. We just don't know uh, the, the first three games. I'm sorry. The first three games, which are. Yeah, no, that's a, no, I'm talking about the conference games that yeah. are going to be the tougher games. Now, in my opinion, uh, I mean, nobody's going to care about this. Uh, you know, Bill Beanbow knows a lot more about football than I do, especially offensive line. But in my opinion, you can't just be like, hey, we're going to find the right guys that are the perfect set and we're going to use these non-conference games to do it. No, I think you need to do it before then and then dominate those games so you can help the entire offense continue to be efficient on their plays. Because if you're screwed up in the offensive line, the running backs can't get valuable reps in before those tougher SEC conference games and so on and so forth. So that's just that's how I see it anyway. Well, you know, and and I'm just now noticing something, Brad. Uh, Our three non-conference games that we start off the season with, right, Uh, going against uh, Temple, Houston, and uh, Tulane, all three are home games. We start off the season with three straight home games. Yeah, I'm um, I'm not as – I'm not. I'm not as ex- excited about that uh, because that just means there's one more uh, SEC conference game that's an away game. But it's good for fans. But in a brutal schedule like what we already have, because you know they go ahead and count a home game against Texas, which is at the Cotton Bowl mm-hmm. um, for us next year. So it it is what it is, man. We've already talked about it. Uh, schedule is going to be tough. As I said, I think we'll get. We'll keep it moving. We'll get the right guy at OC, and we'll keep the recruiting going at a really good level too. Uh, not just Jackson Arnold, you know, reassuring his commitment to Oklahoma. We had Devon Mitchell on Twitter, a tight end, number one tight end, coming out uh, is you know, uh, you know, kind of giving reassurance to Sooner Nation and and several other guys as well. I think uh, uh, Kearney, one of the wide receivers. Um, they're all locked in, as according to their Twitter uh, well, account. So, also, you, you know, and uh, I don't know if it's happened. At least I, there hasn't been any news about this. You haven't seen any kind of mass exodus of players announcing their intention to go to the transfer portal uh, already, like what we saw uh, two years ago. 
Yeah, I mean, it's still early, but obviously you've seen DJ Graham uh, talk about his transfer. He didn't even get on the field this year. So I, I actually – that's I want to see that because that guy is a really talented uh, kid, a good football player, and I want to see him go somewhere where he can get some playing time. But, yeah, other than that, yeah, you're right. I haven't seen seen much going on just yet. It's still early, though. So we'll see after the conference championship games that's usually the week that it starts picking up after some of the teams that played in those champ games can now open up their you know recruitment of of, right. of guys that you know might well, be looking for a move well i mean you know there's nothing else much to talk about i guess our next episode will be uh once we find out who's going to be the acting oc for the bowl game because obviously by levy accepting this job uh he is no uh BV is going to let Levy go ahead and uh, vacate his office and everything like that now. So yep. he can go in and start getting his coaching staff together, uh, start looking at the recruits that they've, uh, that the school has scout previous administration has scouted out and see, I don't know if he's going to go in there like, like prime did and say, go ahead and enter the transfer portal. Uh, they, they come in. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be anything like that going on in Mississippi state, but uh it's going to be interesting to see who does BV choose as the acting OC for the bowl game. Yeah, I think uh, the word on the street right now is Seth Luttrell's already been named the interim uh, okay. OC, but I'm not sure. I don't know if that's true or not, uh, but there's been a few p- different people uh, talking about it all- that already. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, but, uh, you know, we'll know that pretty quickly. I don't think BV is going to waste any time because they mm-hmm. got to you know, start start their bowl preparation. December 28th, more than likely, Alamo Bowl. Uh, so we'll see we'll see what happens, man. All right, brother. Well, it's always good talking OU football to you, man. Until our next episode, Boomer. Sooner. <laughs>